like we never left. Y'all know what it Playoff is. Playoff time, baby. Let's Double go. Double move sports. Playoffs are here. They're happening this week. Hopefully, all you guys have made it in. And you're about to go on a tear. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good your team has been up to this point. If you can get into the playoffs and get hot, you can win a title. And we're going to try to help you guys do that as much as we can. As always, I'm Steph Albiero. I'm here with Alex Lott, the fantasy phenom. And... Man, this is tough. I don't want to give away too many secrets on today's show because we have a head-to-head -head matchup in the first round of the playoffs in our home league. Alex, I'm feeling pretty good about my odds because you just snuck in there. But how are you feeling? Steph, I'm feeling great. I snuck in. We're recording this on Wednesday. I needed like five different dominoes to fall my way on that Tuesday night football game between the Ravens and Cowboys. A couple of them, you know, I just snuck by barely got in the playoffs i'm just happy to be here it's almost poetic that <laughs> this is our first full year doing this in our huge league you know 14 team keeper super competitive that we meet in the first round of the playoffs so look obviously i hope i can beat you this week i'm not feeling like too crazy confident about my chances but i like my squad and a couple good games out of you know the boys julio jones um alvin Kamara. if he can get back on track I i'm feeling all right but it's exciting and look, if you're listening, you are most likely still in the playoffs. So if we've, I want to, I want to try something. If we've helped you at all, just throw in the comments like, hey, I've been riding with you guys all year. We love seeing that stuff. We love seeing when people get championships. So if we have done anything, maybe we've given you a bad start sit decision and you've overcome it anyway, throw that in the comments too. I just want to see how many people have been here riding with us all season long, but I'm super hyped to jump in stuff. A lot's going on around the league. Bye weeks are over. It's full blast here for these last couple weeks. Week 14 is an absolutely loaded week of football starting Thursday night with Rams Patriots and then two big matchups in the primetime slots. We got Steelers versus the Bills on Sunday night football, Ravens versus Browns on Monday night football. Wow. If you would have said before the season, the Ravens Browns game would have the amount of implications and impact in that division and across the league. I think we all would have laughed. The Browns are hot right now, and then we got some pretty loaded matchups outside of the primetime slates. We got the you know Packers-Lions game, supposed to have the highest over-under on the week at 55 and a half. We got some other pretty high-scoring matchups, Tennessee against Jacksonville, Minnesota versus Tampa Bay. I'm looking forward to that one. And then your Colts against Las Vegas, the Raiders Jeez. coming to town. So a lot to talk about here. Let's jump into it with... The biggest headline, I think, across every football outlet that you can find is Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts has been named the starter over Carson Wentz for the Philadelphia Eagles. Tough matchup against the Saints for Hurts' first full start. Actually ended up coming in in week 13, played 41% of snaps, was 5 for 12 passing for 109 yards through a pick. Did end up throwing a touchdown and then had five rushing attempts for 29 yards on the ground. Alex, what is, let, let's first talk about Jalen Hurts. Wow. You know, does he have value for you just as a guy that you want to pick up off of waivers? Maybe he's a guy you had stashed. Are you willing to plug him in in a pretty brutal matchup? First of all, this is the most 2020 thing ever. Here we are, fantasy playoffs. We get the Jalen Hurts versus Taysom Hill quarterback matchup, just like we all saw coming back when we were drafting. But Steph, yeah, we'll get into some of the implications for the other Eagles players. Just one based on off of Jalen Hurts and two based off of other things we're seeing on the field. You know, the dysfunctional offense, the snap counts at all the different position groups that are a bit convoluted. But as far as Jalen Hurts goes, I, I think I'm willing to stash him if you're someone who needs help at the quarterback position. I think you are nuts if you pick up Jalen Hurts this week and then first week plug him in there against a good defense with an offense that's been struggling. I think that's a little bit too crazy for me. But if he went out and had a good fantasy football week, I wouldn't be necessarily surprised. So let's see what he can do against a strong Saints defense this week. Last two weeks, he gets the Cardinals and the Cowboys. So if he can do anything this game, he's got a couple good matchups coming up. And if you're really streaming the position and you want to roll the dice as you move along in the playoffs, I think you can do so. Just watching that game last week against the Packers, Carson Wentz is, is absolutely – brutal to watch right now he's running around in the pocket for no reason he's missing reads his decision making has been incredibly poor he's taking a ton of sacks and Jalen Hurts came in looked good gave him a good spark yes 
his numbers didn't pop off the page, but he gave him a spark in this game, looked really mobile in the pocket, took what the defense gave to him for the most part until that last pick, which was just like desperation comeback mode. So I thought Hurts actually moved the offense a little bit better than Wentz, obviously incredibly small sample size. So let's give it one more game and see, but as a speculative ad, if you're if you've got bench spots and you want to start looking at week 15, week 16 to kind of get ahead of your competition, I don't mind throwing, throwing him on the end of your bench. I think Hertz is a very interesting stash. The reason you're not going to start him this week is because there's no guarantee that Hertz can actually stay in, right. like out on the field the entire game here. Like, what's to say he doesn't come out there, throw two interceptions early and get pulled? They put Wentz back in, a guy they're paying $30 million a year right now. But the ceiling on Jalen Hurts, you know, it's why we've been all over these cheat code quarterbacks with their rushing ability. It's exciting for, for Jalen Hurts. He has the same DNA of guys like Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, even Cam Newton, a guy that we were taking really late in drafts this year that, that helped early on. And why we're so excited for guys like Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields next year is because these mm-hmm. guys are going to be able to run the ball. If you have him, you hold him. Uh, as far as Justin Hur- or Justin Jalen Hurts goes, he's probably already stashed in most leagues, but let's talk about this matchup against the Saints. Their best run defense in the league. Their secondary isn't bad either. I don't think you can trust a single receiver this week. I know Hurts no. had a good-looking ball that he threw up to Jalen Ragor, who was able to come down with it. Uh, I don't think you can trust a single receiver. You, we'll talk more about Miles Sanders later on, but you're, I don't think you can start him with any sort of confidence outside of just a desperation RB2 that you have to plug in just because he's there and that's all you got. But the floor for these guys is so low. Look at just last game, right? Travis Fulgham, Fulgham 0 for 2, 46% of snaps. Alshon Jeffrey did not have a single reception on his one target. Still ended up playing 56% of snaps. Regor caught his one target for 34 yards on 71% of snaps. So Regor was out there the most, stretching the field, trying to, to just pull the defense apart, create some space. Weren't able to get it done. So we got to be out on the Eagles right now. Who knows? Maybe Hurts comes in and he's great. But as it stands today, you can't trust any of these guys in your lineup. Maybe and be like for, for Fulgham, I think you can drop him at this point. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, Rager and Hertz have some appeal in dynasty leagues. Obviously, Miles Sanders does as well. But but for this season, you just you got to be out because every single position group is cannibalizing each other. First of all, the offensive line isn't great. Second of all, you got a rookie quarterback coming in, making his first start next week, and you look at every single group running back. Miles Sanders in the four weeks since he came back from injury after the bye week. Only eight fantasy points per game. Boston Scott over that stretch, 8.3 fantasy points per game. Now you got Jordan Howard, for crying out loud, coming in and getting snaps and touches as well. It's absolutely ridiculous. They should be playing Miles Sanders more, but they're not. When he's out there, they're not using him the right way. And until we see that, I'm out on Miles Sanders in your starting lineup. I'm trying to bench him if possible. Look at the receiver spot. You laid it out perfectly based on what happened last week. I mean, Fulgham, RIP. His snaps and his targets are dwindling. It was a good run, but his time in the spotlight for fantasy football relevancy might be might be over. Alshon is is useless at this point. He's he needs to retire. Honestly, he's out on the field, but he's not doing anything. Rager is nothing more than a deep desperation play. He's on the field the most. Might get a couple deep balls, but you are grasping at straws in like a twenty four team deep <laughs> five wide receiver league. If you're considering starting Jalen Rager right now, I will say at the tight end spot, I think Goddard and Ertz might still be startable i mean the tight end position is such a wasteland that at this point anyone who's out on the field getting five to seven targets at the position with a chance at a touchdown is valuable so for that reason goddard and Ertz, you know with hurts in i i, I want to see his tendencies really first because we know Wentz love to target the tight end but I think you can still start Dallas Goddard. Your expectations need to be in check. You might be able to start Zach Ertz as well, just because otherwise, who are you looking at at the waiver wire? Like Jordan Akins and Kyle Rudolph. Like I, I would probably rather take the Eagles guys. So maybe the tight ends, but everyone else you just got to stay away from. And I think the one thing we're all going to be looking out for this week is a potential Hertz to Ertz touchdown. Let's see if we can get it. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes. Who knew that, that this was going to happen to the Eagles? It sucks to see them go down in flames this season and you know losing the grip on a division that should have been a layup for them, all things considered, at the start of the year. But let's shift over to another wide receiver that we need to talk about whose value has plummeted mm. over the last couple weeks. It really has been 
disappointing fantasy managers all season. And it's DJ Chark. Alex, you and I were so high on DJ Chark as a high-end wide receiver too in drafts. It seemed like he was going to start to deliver early, had some big weeks, but for this week, he has a matchup against Tennessee. Can you start DJ Chark at all? As far as I'm concerned, Chark is not startable in leagues right now. In week 13 against Minnesota, played 88% of snaps, saw seven targets, targets, and he's had a high target share all season long, but only two receptions for 41 yards. He's really been pigeonholed into a pure deep threat role a guy who's explicitly there to stretch the field run these double moves and that's not what an offense is going to do like that role doesn't have a lot of value when it's Mike Lennon and Jake Luton out there throwing you the ball and we saw a rookie wide receiver Colin Johnson come in and he's quietly emerged as the X wide receiver on this offense he caught four of his six targets for 66 yards ended up putting up 10 fantasy points it's concerning. As a DJ Chark shareholder in a lot of places, I think this raises a lot of questions. If Colin Johnson is beating him out for the alpha wide receiver role, the questions are are going to come up. And with all that, though, I think you can't overvalue this season, right? With the bad quarterback play, first year with a new offensive coordinator, a 1-11 record. So going into next year, with the draft capital that the Jacksonville Jaguars are going to have, I think Chark is still a guy you hold on to in Dynasty. Try to buy him low if you possibly can. I was able to move in a rebuilding team, Robert Woods, and you know, for DJ Chark and a draft pick, which I thought at the time was a great move. Great move. But now that I'm seeing this, it's I'm I'm questioning myself a little bit. If Justin Fields, though, comes into this offense and and brings the upside that a quarterback of his profile should be. That's where Chark gets really exciting. You have James Robinson keeping that the motor running in that mm-hmm. offense too. How are you feeling about DJ Chark in 2020 and beyond? Man, I, I'm with you. I, I think DJ Chark is tough to start right now, but honestly, I'm willing to flex Chark this week in round one of the playoffs. And it really? sounds crazy based on what he's done, but this is all based on the matchup. And I know there's concerns about Colin Johnson emerging. Colin Johnson's been involved. He looks good, but it's not really cutting into Chark's snap percentage or his target share if we were seeing like the inverse of what colin johnson is doing happening for chark as far as snaps and targets go i'd be worried but since the bye week chark has still had over 86 percent of snaps in each and every game he's had eight targets a game over that span so he's out there he's involved he hasn't been efficient um which is concerning but if colin johnson is having some efficiency and Chark is not, I think that's going to kind of regress to the mean on both sides. Chark's probably drawing number one coverage, et cetera. And the matchup this week is against the Tennessee Titans. They're 29th in the NFL against the wide receiver position in fantasy football. They've been absolutely roasted all year long. The Titans defense has been straight garbage. And we know their offense can put up points. Jacksonville's probably going to trail, need to throw the ball. I mean, Corey Davis on the Titans in a high scoring game last week just posted 11 for 182 and one um, in that shootout they had with the Browns the Titans have been more of a shootout team than people realize here in 2020 so if they put up points on the Jaguars defense which has been pretty bad I think that the Jaguars are going to need to throw the ball as well Mike Glennon hasn't been great he hasn't lit the world on fire they're obviously struggling at the quarterback position kind of tanking for one of those top quarterbacks but Mike Glennon's been serviceable he's been competent enough to get the ball to his wide receivers even um uh, jake luton a few weeks ago with chark led chark to the big 27 point outing he had against houston seven for 146 and a touchdown in the right matchup so i'm willing to roll out chark this week as a flex the touchdown upside is probably lower than normal but he's getting snaps um, he's getting targets and i think he could put up a flex worthy game for you here in round one of the playoffs yeah, you're right. There's a lot of things to like, even with Mike Glennon out there. I mean, Glennon, they're letting him throw the ball a ton, 38.5 attempts per game. You just, it, the efficiency is such a concern. Colin Johnson emerging as a concern. Yeah. I will say there was a red zone attempt that DJ Shark sh- should have caught, but it actually bounced off his hands and LaVisca Chenal ended up grabbing that ball in the end zone so i do think things are going to regress but it's just scary to see a guy that 
you know, had the season that Chark had kind of regress and, and, and be put into a different position on that team. We'd love to just see him as this bona fide alpha wide receiver. I think this just raises some questions on that, but he still has to be a guy you got to hold. And the, the upside is there. I mean, if there's a week to start him, it's got to be this week against Tennessee there, right? Like we saw Tennessee last week, Tannehill, Corey Davis, A.J. Brown, and that shootout with Baker Mayfield, Jarvis Landry, and some of the other options, Donovan Peoples-Jones, Rashard Higgins getting involved in Cleveland. I really think that this Tennessee Titans team is built for shootouts. They put up a ton of points on the Colts as well a couple weeks back. The defense hasn't stopped anybody. Their offense clearly can put up points in a hurry with some of the weapons they have. Um, obviously, A.J. Brown, Derrick Henry, Tannehill's been great. Corey Davis has emerged. I just really think that balance, kind of what we talked about earlier in the year with the Cowboys, no defense and a lot of weapons on offense with Dak and Amari and CeeDee Lamb that were putting up points. It was kind of the perfect storm for these shootout games. We've started to see Tennessee ship towards that. So when a game against Jacksonville, as long as Jacksonville can kind of keep up and put up points, which we've seen them do a decent job of over the past couple of weeks, I think um, we could see a pretty competitive game here. So if there's a week to start them, it's this week. Moving forward in the playoffs, I don't know. Dynasty, I do like the move you made. I think Colin Johnson, DJ Chark, and Chenault could be a good combo with Chark kind of leading the way if they get a better quarterback. But I'm in on Chark this week. I really think he's going to have a solid game. Oh, you're, you're higher on Chark than I am. I'm, I would not touch him with a 10-foot pole this week. I, I just think you cannot rely on him. There's other options that are out there, even on waivers right now. I'd rather plug in a guy like Cole Beasley over DJ Chark. But oh. let's let's talk about the running back. For this Jacksonville Jaguars team, really the the star of the show, <laughs> fantasy wise this season, really should be put on a pedestal for what he's done as an undrafted free agent rookie. You already know what I'm going to say. James Robinson, out of Illinois State, 22 years old, 5'10", 220, sitting at the RB4 in PPR leagues, 212 attempts, almost a thousand yards, 4.5 yards per attempt, has seven touchdowns on the year. Has caught 80% of his 53 targets, 310 yards through the air, and two receiving touchdowns. And the question always comes up, right? People are hesitant to pull the trigger on James Robinson in dynasty deals and even hesitant early on in the season in a redraft. Asking the question, a guy who's an undrafted free agent... Right? Is he sticky? Is he a guy that the team is gonna you know, keep around when you then go out and, and bring in a stud from the first round? And the, the answer to this question at this point, we can't look past it. James Robinson is a stud. He should be the rookie of the year. Let's put this into perspective what he's doing. If we, if we just extrapolate his current stats out for a 16 game season, he's gonna finish with 283 carries just under 1,300 rushing yards. Both of those metrics would be in the top five carries and rushing yards last season. And then nine touchdowns, 56 receptions, and almost three receiving touchdowns, which are all top 10 at the position in 2019. So not only is he a volume monster, he's an efficiency monster. And I went in back and looked at some of the notable rookie seasons over the last couple of years. And here's some of the guys that James Robinson is, is comparable with, with his current pace and, and how those seasons went. He's better than guys like Philip Lindsay, Jordan Howard, just blowing them out of the wire, out of the water. His rookie year stat-wise is very similar to guys like Kareem Hunt or Todd Gurley, their rookie seasons. He's pretty much a light version of what 2016 Ezekiel Elliott, who had all this hype, had the draft capital. I mean, J J James Robinson is doing pretty close to what Zeke did in his first year, 18.7 fantasy points per game, sixth amongst all running backs. There, I just see no way that Jacksonville can look at James Robinson and want to add anything more into the backfield other than maybe a third down Chris Thompson scat back type of guy. But even then, that should be completely fine for James Robinson's fantasy value in 2021. He's the heart and soul of the team every single week right now. And the Jags need to address other positions. So going back to what we just talked about with DJ Chark, you know, Justin Fields coming into this offense potentially. We'll see how that goes with QB wise. Who knows? Maybe they make a move, try to bring Trevor in. But any upgrade of the QB position is only going to help this offense. The upside only gets better for James Robinson if the offense is better. And I got one more point to make on James Robinson. This could be completely just going down narrative street. But from what I've read, Shad Khan, who bought the Jacksonville Jaguars a few years ago, his son 
has, quote, a passion for analytics, and he leads the analytics department for the Jaguars. If they have any sense of analytics in that front office, they should have no desire to draft a running back with any significant draft capital. They should be fully content on leaving a 22-year-old running back. Has not even been anywhere close to his age apex yet. He should only get better. There's no way they're going to take him out of there. So I'm all in on James Robinson, man. I think he's a locked and loaded stud. Have him as a top 10 dynasty running back. Anybody who's talking to say anything against him is just looking at the draft capital. And they're they're having take lock because of that. Because you can't look at what he's doing on the field and not say he's a great running back. I'm with you. I mean, James Robinson has grown on me and a lot of people as the season went on. After those first couple games, I thought, okay, he happened to get the starting job after Fournette was cut, had a lot of volume, had some solid fantasy games. And as the season went on, it was like, oh, like this guy's going to be a fantasy asset all year long, but surely it's going to taper off. Surely at some point, you know, he's going to regress to the mean, but still be valuable this year. And they'll look to bring someone in. But as the season has gone along, there is no reason to believe that the Jaguars need to bring another running back that's going to take significant volume into this backfield. I mean, James Robinson can truly do it all. He's been absolutely incredible. And it shows up on the stat sheet and on film. He just looks fantastic when he's on the field. He's like this highlight flash in the pan for the Jaguars who are otherwise miserable to watch. And you look (laughs) at what he's doing. He's third in the NFL in total snaps this season. So he has absolute workhorse potential. You talk about these valuable fantasy running backs, you know, the Zeke's of the world, the Christian McCaffrey's, um, people who do it all. They run, they catch everything for their team. He's getting the snaps. He's giving you 18 carries a game along with four targets a game. Just incredible volume. And he's been fairly efficient with it as well. And like you said about the quarterback, a better quarterback next season and beyond is only going to help James Robinson because he's putting up this crazy season. He's RB4 right now in PPR in terms of total points. That's on a team that is 24th in yards per game and 27th in points per game. So imagine James wow. Robinson on an offense that's better, um, who actually has you know more scoring opportunities and a better quarterback. The sky's the limit for this guy. So I'm with you. I think James Robinson – is the future for Jacksonville's backfield. And you look at the Jaguars, this is a little bit of narrative street, but they draft Leonard Fournette several years back as a top five pick. Things didn't really pan out. He had a, a, you know, a few really good years in Jacksonville, but here they are several years later with James Robinson, who was undrafted. And he's a special player for sure, but an undrafted guy putting up better production than Fournette did in any of his years in Jacksonville as an undrafted guy when Fournette was a top five pick should just point the Jaguars to address other needs. Obviously, the quarterback position is going to be a need, but you said at the O-line and the defense as well. So I'm with you, James Robinson. I really think is their future. He's been an absolute um, highlight this season, and I think he has as good of a case for the fantasy football MVP than anybody because you got someone for free who is a top five running back right now. That's almost absolutely unheard of. If you had James Robinson, if you were the person that scooped him up, you probably have a pretty good shot of being in the playoffs right now, and he's going to be someone you can keep plugging in to get you to that title. I'm still floored on how the the team that I had with Alvin Kamara, James Robinson, and then loaded just tons of depth at running back, DeAndre Swift, Leonard Fournette earlier in the year, Duke Johnson when David Johnson was hurt. Somehow that team did not make the playoffs, but that's That's not the nor there. Let's talk about my Browns. Throw some respect on the Browns name, man. We've we've been the laughing stock of the league for so long, and now everyone wants to join on the bandwagon. I know the hype was was just there, there's no way the hype after last season bringing Odell Beckham in that we were going to live up to that in any way. We were mediocre in, in all facets of the game. There were a few highlights here or there, but this running back group of Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, like both some of the most talented. I think, Nick Chubb, you can make a strong case for a top five, maybe even top three running back in the NFL right now. Definitely one of the best pure just downfield runners. Let's talk about this backfield because it was one that, you know, going into the year, we were fine taking both of these guys at their ADP. You know, we were worried about, you know, with really we were worried for Kareem Hunt, wondering, you know, is he going to be able to produce – any sort of consistent basis with Nick Chubb in the lineup. So Alex, let's break down this this Kareem Hunt, Nick Chubb. You know, we, we talked about it so much before the season. Let's kind of revisit this backfield that's been carrying the Browns to this 9-3 and three record, potentially a playoff run coming up for the Browns. 
I got to imagine you're starting both guys every single week in fantasy, but let's take it a step deeper. Yeah, you're definitely starting both guys. First, we'll start with Chubb because he's like a lock every single week. I mean, he's been an absolute beast. 19 carries a game in the four games he's played since his return. With 19 carries a game, he's averaging 6.1 yards per carry over the past four weeks. Absolutely absurd. Um, Stud. Like you said, he's got the touchdown upside. He might be the best true runner in the NFL. And in the seven full games he's played this season, averaging over 18 fantasy points a game. So he's a locked in top 10, probably top eight, top five running back here for the rest of the way with the volume, with the touchdown upside and the efficiency on a Browns team that's absolutely crushing it on the ground. We saw this coming. I mean, Stefanski from Minnesota last year, that great running scheme when they wanted to run Dalvin Cook 30 times a game, came to Cleveland. Then we all said if they can pull this off with a better line with Nick Chubb, with Cream Hunt, this could be an awesome power run team. So They're absolutely doing that. So Chubb's in your lineup with Hunt. Things get interesting because I do think he's still an every week start, but his value's kind of been a bit of a roller coaster this year. You know, in draft season, it was draft Kareem Hunt. He's a low end RB2 who has upside if Chubb gets hurt to be an RB1. And over the first four weeks of the season, when they were both active, we saw both of them performing as an RB1. And I do think Hunt's stats and his perception was a little bit inflated because he scored five touchdowns in four games when they both were on the field early in the season. So Hunt was putting up ridiculous. That'll do it. (laughs) Yeah, Hunt was putting up ridiculous numbers. Then Chubb goes down. We see Hunt's efficiency kind of drop off, but he's still putting up those consistent RB1 numbers. I believe he's the RB9 right now. Let me fact check. Yep, Yep, Kareem Hunt's the RB9 in in full PPR. So, you know, the inflated touchdowns early and then Chubb going out really just took his value – off like a rocket ship. So now people are like, oh, Kareem Hunt's a locked in RB1 even when Chubb comes back. But since Chubb has returned, Hunt's snap percentage has been leveling off to a concerning point. I mean, 58, 54, 41, and 47% of snaps doesn't kill you at the running back spot. Um, You know, 14 carries a game and two and a half targets a game definitely doesn't kill you either. But he's really lacked a lot of of efficiency since Chubb has been back in the lineup, less than three yards per carry over his past three games, where Chubb has had that ridiculous 6.1 yards per carry. So I think you still can start Hunt every week as an RB2, but you kind of have to value him. You got to think way back to August, way back to September when you were drafting and say, I'm drafting a guy who's the backup running back. He's going to get, you know, 12 to 15 touches in this game. You know, they might skew more towards the air in games where the Browns need to pass the ball more towards receptions for Kareem Hunt, which obviously is valuable, but you just can't value him as an RB1 anymore. He is a guy you're still starting, a top 24 back, but you just need to kind of level set your expectations as we move forward into the fantasy playoffs. Yeah, two two things on Kareem Hunt. You know, when you look at top end running backs and then you look at their matchups, you say, okay, right, we, we circle a game like, I'll use Kareem Hunt's game log, Jacksonville. His matchup against Jacksonville should have been an absolute smash play. They're one of the worst run defenses in the league, but the floor just gets pulled out from under him because of Nick Chubb taking away those opportunities, taking away goal line work. Uh, Like, for example, you look at his game against Jacksonville in week 12 on 41% of snaps, had 10 carries for 62 yards. So pretty efficient, right? 6.2 yards per attempt. Saw two targets, didn't catch either of them. So it's just a situation where the floor gets so low and it's just, you never know when it's going to happen because it could be a Nick Chubb game. It could be a Kareem Hunt game. And the thing that's really brought Kareem Hunt down in my rankings, both in Dynasty and Redraft, especially going into next year. And as a Kareem Hunt Dynasty investor, I'm trying to sell him right now uh, if I can for, for anything substantial because we saw when Nick Chubb wasn't in the lineup, Kareem Hunt wasn't this bona fide RB1 that was yep. absolutely exploding like a lot of us thought he would be. He was not a you know stud RB1, Dalvin Cook, Christian McCaffrey type of guy. He was not the Kareem Hunt that we saw his rookie season or even the year after when he was with the Kansas City Chiefs. So I'm tempering expectations with him if Nick Chubb is ever out of the lineup because we've, he's shown that just because he's the only guy in that backfield doesn't mean but he's going to be an absolute stud. So take that, you know, how you want to take it. I think it just says, look, Nick Chubb is better than Kareem Hunt. I think we all knew that. But that's been a, a you know, a confirmed locked-in thing where Kareem Hunt does give you 
a lot of hope and where a lot of his value comes from is his utilization in the passing game, his efficiency in the red zone. When he does get the opportunities, they get you excited. But as it stands right now with both guys in the lineup, you just never know when Kareem Hunt, even in the best matchup, may still only give you six to 10 fantasy points. So Alex, let's get into our running back start segment. I want to take some time out real quickly here. Talk about the first name on this list. I think we need to spend some extra time on this one it's because a big week. Fantasy, fantasy managers are tilting. They may even have this guy in the playoffs having to make a really difficult start-sit decision on Miles Sanders, who plays New Orleans. We talked about Jalen Hurts coming into this, this offense now. Could present a floor that wasn't even there with Carson Wentz, who was, who's been absolutely terrible this year. And with Miles Sanders, right – Look at his weeks two through five, 21.2 opportunities a game, 103 yards a game, and a touchdown every other game. And then, and that was in some tough matchups, Pittsburgh, the Rams, San Francisco, and then he hurts his knee in week six. And since then, when, since he's returned from that knee injury, weeks 10 through 13, he's only seeing 15 opportunities a game coming down from that 21 57 yards and zero touchdowns per game. And it's all been in soft matchups. The Giants, the Browns, the Seahawks, and the Packers. It's tough right now if you're Miles Sanders' manager because he he was so dominant, even in the worst matchups early on. And now since that bye week, since coming back in week 10, it's just been brutal. And he just burned you the week before the fantasy playoffs. 10 carries against Green Bay for 31 yards. Saw one target, did not catch it. Only three fantasy points. Three fantasy points, and he's only playing 56% of snaps. This is a guy that was playing as high as 85% of snaps earlier in the year. For Sanders, I think it's part injury, which has led to so much more. It's part injury, part offense woes. Is he a guy that you're willing to start in the first week of the fantasy playoffs man this is this hurts because here we are like this is why you got to stick with it you don't win your league at the draft because here we are miles sanders was like a second round pick in most drafts and i would sit him this week i would start jd mckissick over miles sanders in a ppr league just because he's gonna get catches and jd mckissick was free (laughs) so yeah I'd, i'd sit him i mean you made good points there the usage is just falling off a cliff I mean, the last two weeks, six carries and 10 carries just isn't going to get it done when the receiving work's not there either. I mentioned it earlier on the show. I mean, over the last four weeks since Sanders came back off the bye week, off of that injury, eight fantasy points a game. Boston Scott, his own teammate with less snaps in that time, is averaging 8.3 fantasy points per game. So now you bring in Jordan Howard who we thought we didn't even know if he was going to be elevated to the active roster actually was elevated, was activated for their last game, got a handful of carries as well. I don't think you can trust Miles Sanders and you throw in these two extra variables. And this is what makes the decision easy for me. One Jalen hurts, a rookie quarterback coming in and starting. We don't know what to expect. And Hey, maybe Jalen hurts is what Miles Sanders needs. Maybe Jalen hurts comes in, plays great, dumps it down to the running back a lot. Sanders gets a lot of snaps. They get more scoring opportunities. If that's the case, weeks 15 and 16, we'll start Miles Sanders. But I'm not taking that risk in my playoffs with a guy like Sanders. And the second thing is the New Orleans matchup. New Orleans is first in the NFL against the running back position this season. They're only allowing 16 fantasy points per game to opposing running backs, all running backs. So how are you going to break that 16 points up between Miles Sanders, Boston Scott, and Jordan Howard? You have to assume, you know, Jordan Howard's going to get a couple carries. Boston Scott's probably going to get a couple catches. It doesn't leave a lot of opportunity for Miles Sanders or his upside in this game. So as crazy as it sounds, I would leave Miles Sanders on my bench this week. I would start J.D. McKissick over him. I would start Naheem Hines over Miles Sanders. And I know there's a couple more guys we're going to talk about on this list that I would start over Miles Sanders as well which sounds absolutely crazy, but I'm just not going down like this, man. <laughs> yeah. The, the, so I'll, I'll give a perfect example here. My running backs in, in our league. So we have this matchup coming up. First round of the playoffs. Yeah, you have this decision against me. I wish you would start Miles Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's not going to happen because my other two running backs are J.K. Dobbins and David Johnson. Even David Johnson in a tough matchup, getting worked back in from that injury, I'm still going with him over Miles Sanders right now. I think you have to temper expectations with Miles Sanders to the point that he's a low-end RB2 this week. And so you look at names like Gio Bernard versus Dallas, Ronald Jones against Minnesota, even Miles Gaskin against Kansas City, which we'll talk about a little bit later in our starts of the week. Little preview there. All those names I'm taking over Miles Sanders this week, it's, it's been absolutely horrible to see because we thought, look, oh, finally, Doug Peterson's going to have a full-time, full-usage RB1 on his team, and we're just not getting that. And, and there's just so many factors that play into it, so I think you got to fade Sanders. For now, we'll revisit this, I'm sure, next week if something does change. But as it stands right now, you, unless it's just a, a desperation spot, you have no other good running backs – you're not starting Miles Sanders. But let's talk about the other running back start sits on our list. There's some pretty big names in here that have been disappointing and some very sneaky options that have started to emerge. We'll start off the first one here, Todd Gurley against the Chargers, who are 22nd against the run. Gurley coming off a brutal stretch over the last three games. Didn't play week 12. He has the knee injury, of course, right? Todd Gurley's knee, Todd Gurley's knee. It's all we ever hear about when we talk about Todd Gurley, the arthritic knee. Since the bye week in week 10, hasn't had more than four fantasy points in a game. We'll cut him some slack against New Orleans because that's who he's played both of those weeks when he's been active. But his snap share is under 40%. This is a guy that the team cannot trust, a guy who is running extremely inefficiently, 3.3 and 2 yards per attempt over the last two games that he's been active. The value with him was the touchdown volume. He was actually getting some receptions earlier in the year, had really soft matchups, really the first nine weeks of the season that set him up well. And then since then, the wheels have kind of come off. But now he has another good matchup in the Chargers, Are you willing to roll Todd Gurley back out there with any sort of confidence in the playoffs? Steph, we'll see if you can finish this sentence for me. Not no. But hell no. Exactly. Todd Gurley, man, I hope you had the chance to sell high because you had about 10 weeks to do it. And we said it each and every week, Todd Gurley's a sell high. But then he would just fall into the end zone once or twice again. And it's like, okay, Todd Gurley's a sell high. Then he would fall into the end zone again. And hopefully you got (laughs) out at the right time because, I mean, nine touchdowns in the first nine games we knew was not sustainable for a Todd Gurley that, quite frankly, looked bad. Like, he was running into the end zone, falling into the end zone, but he didn't look fast. He didn't look explosive. He didn't look quick. He wasn't involved in the receiving game. He looked so bad on the field, and he just happened to put up a good stat line and was consistently saved by touchdowns. So that's why you can't just – you know, look at the box score to make your fantasy football decisions. You need to, you know, watch the game, see how guys look, see what people are saying about him, read the reports that are happening within the organization because Todd Gurley, he's such a trap. He is such a big name. I have zero confidence starting him this week, even in a good matchup. And I know if he plays, people are going to roll him out there because it's Todd Gurley. And and unless he gets lucky and falls in the end zone and gets you 10 points, I really believe he's going to burn you. I mean, the 33% of snaps last week just isn't it. He's clearly still bothered by that knee injury, and he was limited in practice today when we were recording on Wednesday. So he's clearly not 100%. I think 100% of the current Todd Gurley, quite frankly, isn't that great anyway. So I'm trying to stay away from Gurley in this matchup. I'm with you, man. I have him as a low-end RB3. Guys, I'm taking over him would be like Chase Edmonds. Latavius yeah. Murray, Devontae Booker, if, if Josh Jacobs is out, Leonard Fournette, Adrian Peterson, if DeAndre Swift is out, all these guys I'm taking over Todd Gurley. I don't think you can start him with any sort of confidence. And I'm, I'm concerned, you know, I, he may retire after this year. He I don't know if done. he's going to get a contract. Yeah, this could be it. This could be it. Well, let's talk about another big name, Raheem Mostert, who came back from injury. We all expected him to slot – back right into his regular role, which, you know, early in the season was playing, you know, 20 and 20 to 60% of snaps. That was really just game script dependent, but was producing in all those scenarios, was hitting big breakaway runs in one of the games here, like against the Jets. He had eight carries for 92 yards and a touchdown on the ground and was actually getting a little bit more passing work that we hadn't seen him get in 2019. 
And so things were looking full steam ahead for Raheem Mostert. He came back for a little bit before going down with injury again, weeks five and six, was able to still produce. But then week 13 against Buffalo, which should have been an easy matchup, only played 44% of snaps, had nine carries for 42 yards, caught one reception for one yard, only 5.3 fantasy points and what should have been a smash play for him. Can you trust Raheem Mostert right now? Is he a guy you want to roll out in week 14 against this Washington football team that's had a pretty dominant front seven right now, the third against running backs? Yeah, I mean, I think you can start Raheem Mostert because if you've been paying attention to his snap shares and his touches, nothing has really changed. I know last week, you know, the nine carries is a bit low, but he's played six full games this season and he's only exceeded 50% of snaps one time. And he, he's just not a guy who typically is playing, you know, the whole game. They have other backs they use. They throw Tevin Coleman in there. Jeff Wilson has obviously been hyper-involved. McKinnon is still active as well as kind of a receiving back. And we know that's not Mostert's game. So against Washington, I think this is going to be kind of like a slugfest. I expect a pretty low over-under in this one. I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but I imagine it's in the low 40s. Um, so I don't expect a lot of points here. I think maybe if the 49ers can keep it close or even get a lead in this game, then Mostert could see a little bit more work because they'll stay balanced throughout the entire game. So with Raheem Mostert, you're banking on this Kyle Shanahan run scheme that is so elite. You're banking on efficiency. You're banking on Mostert's speed and his breakaway potential and also hoping he gets into the end zone. So I think Mostert is right there as an RB2. You can start him. I certainly like him more than Todd Gurley and Miles Sanders this week. Um, So yeah, yeah, I think you got to roll him out there. To me, he's kind of in that very different player but I think he's kind of in that Kareem Hunt tier. You know, he's going to get his handful of touches. You hope he can get into the end zone with him. With Hunt, you're kind of relying on the receptions. With Mostert, you're hoping on efficiency and maybe a touchdown. So two very different players that I think are right there as low-end RB2s that you have to have in your lineup as we move into the playoffs here in Week 14. I'm with you, man. And to, to spot check you on that over-under, it's 43 and a half. So great guess there. Pretty low scoring game. Vegas expects San Francisco to actually pull this one out. They're three and a half point favorites in that matchup. But let's talk about a guy who just emerged in week 13 against the Vegas Raiders who are abysmal against the run. But we saw Frank Gore leave the game with a concussion and Ty Johnson, formerly a, a running back for the Detroit Lions, now with the New York Jets, played 63% of snaps. Had 22 carries for 104 yards, a touchdown on the ground, and was two for two through the air for 13 extra yards there. So Ty Johnson smashed 19.7 fantasy points. He's probably available on a lot of waiver wires. And he has Seattle this week. They're 24th against the run. We know how bad the Seattle defense has been. If Frank Gore is out, how excited are you for Ty Johnson? Because I think he's a guy that I'm willing to plug in either as a flex or a desperation RB2. This is getting so tough, man, because obviously, one, like you said, this is all assuming Frank Gore is out this week. But, man, I watched that Seattle-New York Giants game last week, and I don't know why the Giants didn't give it to Wayne Gallman more often. He was absolutely gashing them every single time he got the ball. Gallman against Seattle last week, 16 for 135. Every single time, it was a huge run. So the matchup is actually really good but I just don't know if I can trust the Jets you know fourth string running back who has emerged to be the starter and in the first round of my playoffs so if I have any other option any other option even if it's a lower ceiling higher floor option I'm probably leaning that way because we could come out and see Ty Johnson go for five points and barely get used so I think he has some upside but you've got to be really desperate to start Ty Johnson but I will say this Todd Gurley or Ty Johnson, I think I'd actually go with Ty Johnson, which absolutely pains me to say, but that's kind of where I'm at. I kind of want to paint a picture of where I'm at with with Todd Gurley, and it's just that low to where I think Ty Johnson actually has more upside in the same floor this week. I think I would still lean Miles Sanders over Ty Johnson, and I certainly would play Mostert over Johnson. Um, But, yeah, I think he is – you know, I'm trying to sit him, but if I'm desperate, if I have injuries – You can roll him out there and hope he can replicate something similar to what he did last week, but I definitely would not count on it. Yeah, as it stands right now, Frank Gore did practice. He had a limited practice when we're recording here on Wednesday. 
And Adam Gase says that he thinks Frank Gore is going to be able to play. So assuming Gore is in there and is going to get any yeah, level of Johnson. usage, you want to stay away from Ty Johnson. But if Gore is announced out, I think Ty Johnson is a guy that you can plug in if you have him stashed on the back of your roster and you need something. But let's talk about the guy you just talked about, Wayne Gallman. Wayne Gallman, like we talked about James Robinson is kind of being the star of the show for 2020 fantasy football. Wayne Gallman is quietly making a case of his own, has been an absolute stud since he's been put in there, and a guy that you can actually rely on on a consistent basis. I have missed an RB2 this week, a comfortable RB2 this week against Arizona. They're 17th against their running back position. Are you with me on Wayne Gallman and this this emerging yeah. Giants offense? <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, since week seven, Wayne Gallman's the RB6. So... 15.8 fantasy points per game since he's elevated to that starting role. He scored six touchdowns in six games. He's been fantastic for this Giants team. And I think if Daniel Jones is active, that only helps Wayne Gallman because it should lead to more scoring opportunity. This past week was the first week since taking over as the starter that he did not get into the end zone. And I think that was just because they were managing the game without Daniel Jones and they were able to pull out that win, which – was an incredible upset that between that game and the Washington Steelers game. What a weird week of upsets in the NFL. That's <laughs> great. Week. Any, literally anything can happen at any time, but yeah, lock Allman in. He's been fantastic. He looks good. He runs with power. He looks like he gets shot out of a cannon every time. He's got great touchdown upside. Doesn't give you a ton in the receiving game, but he gets maybe a target here and there. So I'm locking in Wayne Gallman. I think he's a really strong, safe floor RB two this week. So let's move over to our wide receiver start sit segment. Some pretty big names on here as well, as well as some super deep, you know, slowly emerging options. We'll hit on all of them here. The first one, though, Jarvis Landry, who just does nothing but deliver wide receiver two performances every single season, it feels like. Doesn't matter who, you know, what situation, what QB, what other wide receivers he's competing with. And over the last two weeks, he's put up over 20 fantasy points. Those games against Jacksonville and the Tennessee Titans now goes into a week 14 matchup against the Baltimore Ravens who are 12th against the wide receiver. But on this tear, are you willing to throw Jarvis Landry back in? Cause I think he's, he's right in that flex category for me. Yeah, I think so. I, I'm certainly willing to flex him. He's, we thought this was going to come when Odell Beckham went down, you know, just the influx of targets in the first couple games, we were disappointed against Houston and Philly, only five targets, two targets, really, really tough fantasy weeks. But we got to remember both of those games were in abysmal weather, like super windy, raining, and both teams were keeping it on the ground. I think the Houston score was like 10 to seven. So that is really why we didn't see Jarvis produce there for a couple weeks. Last two games, 11 targets and 10 targets, 28 and 20 fantasy points, even in a tough matchup against Baltimore. I think it's going to be a competitive game. If the Browns have the ability to just run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, they're going to. We saw it in the second half against Tennessee. Baker had like 300 yards and four touchdowns in the first half and didn't do much in the second half because they were just running the ball. So I do think they're going to need to throw it. Jarvis should be involved, should be a 10-target guy this week. And anytime you're getting 10 targets, I think that's someone you can flex regardless of the quarterback. And we were talking before the show, Steph, Baker's been playing – better than people give him credit for this year throughout the whole season. So I'm willing to start Jarvis Landry this week, even in a, you know, tough perceived matchup against Baltimore. You can almost look like, look at Jarvis Landry, like Stefan Diggs light back, you know, last year of the last couple of seasons when Kevin Stefanski was in Minnesota. It's certainly a run first team, but this is the guy that they're going to go to who can make big plays for them has had a touchdown the last two weeks. I think they're going to use him. And so with all that being said, Jarvis Landry, lock him in as a strong flex play or desperation wide receiver too, even in a tough matchup against Baltimore. Another guy in a tough matchup who's been in this category, you know, he's been in our start sits a lot this year. He's been a guy that's had a lot of polarizing opinions set about him. It's Devontae Parker, who has a matchup against the Kansas City Chiefs. They're second in the league among against wide receivers. How are you evaluating Devontae Parker? I don't want to start him this week, and I hate to say it because you know I love Devontae. We're both Louisville guys, big Devontae Parker fans, but without Fitzpatrick, we've just seen his value kind of level off, and the volume just isn't quite there. He's had a couple games where he's gotten into the end zone with Tua. 
um, that have definitely elevated his value. But, you know, last week, four for 35 just isn't going to get it done, where the week before he had eight for 119 with Ryan Fitzpatrick. So you can just easily see the difference in Devontae Parker's performance with and without Ryan Fitzpatrick. Now, Tua definitely does like to throw the ball to Devontae if he's going to throw it to the wide receiver position. So, you know, I'm trying to fade Devontae Parker this week against the Chiefs, who are good against the wide receivers. Tua has really liked throwing to Gasecki at the tight end position. Their defense has been strong this year. They've ran the ball fairly well. So I'm trying to fade Devontae Parker if possible, but if you have to flex him here, I totally understand it. The Dolphins should have to be throwing the ball through the duration of this game but I'm probably trying to fade and bench Devontae Parker if I can. I'm surprised you're you're that low on it because you, you think about how this game script's going to play out. I think the Dolphins are going to need to throw the ball a ton. And I think Devontae Parker's a guy who can deliver should the target volume be there. Of course, we love him with Fitzmagic. Fitzmagic's a guy that's just going to throw it up, eyes closed, and say, I think P- Parker can go out and make a play. Two is not that way. Two is more come from the same cloth as like Baker Mayfield where he's not going to have this alpha X wide receiver that goes bananas every single week. He's going to target the tight ends. He's going to target the running back. So you, know, you look at that and, you know, yes, it just certainly caps the floor for Parker, but the matchup to me dictates that he should be a low end wide receiver to a locked in flex play this week. And I'll, like I said, I'll talk about Miles yeah, Gaskin later. I think later. you changed my mind. I, th- I think you changed my mind. I, I think I would be willing to flex Parker. <laughs> The live on the show flip. We throw those takes out there. Love to see it. See, see, you're not listening to the guys here who are locked in, stuck in on these takes. They're willing to change it with new information when the right, uh, you know, discussion, the right points are brought up. So hit us up in those comments with your thoughts. But I'm I'm willing to plug in Parker this week. Now a guy that I'm not willing to plug in. I'm curious if you feel the same way. It's Kiki QT. Wide receiver for the Houston Texans, who absolutely exploded against your Colts last week on 75% of snaps with Will Fuller now out of that lineup, caught eight of his nine targets for 141 yards. Also had a few, uh, you know, for for those of you in leagues that reward kick return and, and punt return yardage, he had some of that as well. He's used in a lot of different ways in this offense. Is QT a guy that you're willing to go back to the well with after a big week? I even saw in some leagues, some deeper leagues, people were plugging him in there, and he paid off, delivering 22.1 fantasy points in PPR leagues. Week 14, though, against Chicago, are you in or out on QT? Um, I'm out. I mean, if he had a big week, would it surprise me? No, but I'm just not counting on it. You know, it's a tough matchup against Chicago. I'm just not banking on the targets being there. Last week, he saw nine targets and turned it into eight for 141. That's a super efficient game. I think they will need to utilize him and get creative, but I'm just not expecting them to be able to go downfield the QT like they were able to do last week. So I'm out on QT this week. He, he's a boomer bust option. Someone, if you're desperate, you can throw in there, but I definitely would take Parker, Landry, even DJ Chark, who we talked about earlier on the show over QT this week. The thing that gets you excited for QT is is his speed, right? He's he's a four four three guy, but he's a little undersized, 5'10", 181. He plays in a lot of different positions over the field, but primarily in the slot. Plays in the slot on sixty percent of his snaps, so he's interesting. I, I think he's an interesting flex flyer, but not a guy that you want to start if you're you know making a playoff run. If you're having to plug in Kiki QT, your roster is probably on its last leg and you're fighting tooth and nail just to get into the playoffs. So if you're a contending team, if you feel strong, you have other options, you have a Jarvis Landry, Devontae Parker, even some other guys that we'll talk about here like Corey Davis, willing to plug in all those guys over Kiki QT this week, even though he did have a boom game and I'm happy for him. But let's talk about Gabriel Davis, another rookie who had a great performance against the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, it has really been playing well over the last couple weeks against the Chargers, had 16.9 fantasy points, three receptions and a touchdown against San Francisco, another three receptions and a touchdown. Looking at me like a guy who's getting inflated by the touchdowns that he's scoring. I don't think you can lock in those every single week, but taking over that John Brown role has had some significance for this Bills roster, but against Pittsburgh, are you willing to roll out 
Gabriel Davis. No, I think he's a good stash in Dynasty. He's shown a lot of flashes this year. Last two weeks, playing 97% of snaps, um, almost identical stat lines. He went three receptions on four targets for 79 yards and a touchdown. Then he went three receptions on four targets for 68 yards and a touchdown. And even with the snaps he's playing, the targets just aren't quite there. He's a big play guy, very dependent on those touchdowns, and he's just a boomer bust option. He's someone, if he gets into the end zone, he'll give you a solid you know, 15-ish point week, and if not, you're going to be disappointed. So I'm sitting Gabriel Davis, and I'm not rolling those dice here in the first round of my playoffs. If the matchup was anyone but Pittsburgh, I'd feel a lot more confident. You know, give him, give him Atlanta, give him Seattle, give him Minnesota. But considering it's Pittsburgh, I expect them to be able to shut down at least some element of the Buffalo passing offense, which makes me really scared for Gabriel Davis. Would feel much confident, much more confident with like Cole Beasley, um, and I think Stephon Diggs is still a, a matchup proof stud wide receiver. But for Davis, he's a fun rookie. He's exciting, but I don't think you can plug him in. Last one here, Corey Davis against Jacksonville. They're 28th against the pass. And Davis just finished as, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Alex. I think he was the wide receiver one last week with 35.2 fantasy points, 78% of snaps, 12 targets, caught 11 of them for 182 yards and a touchdown. I'm, I'm fully prepared to go back to the well on Corey Davis. He's on a hot stretch over the last four weeks with, 11, 16, 10, and 35 fantasy points. You add in the Jacksonville matchup, super soft. Davis, I think, is actually a smash play. Might be a guy I'm looking at in DFS, depending on his price. Are you with me on that? 100%. I mean, Steph, in a good matchup, would we consider sitting um, Terry McLaurin or Chris Godwin or Mike Evans or Deontay Johnson, Cooper Cup? Would you consider sitting any of those guys in a good matchup? Probably not. No. Corey no. Davis is averaging more fantasy points per game than every single guy I just named so far for the full season. More fantasy wow. points per game than McLaurin, than Godwin, than Tyler Boyd, who has gone off when he had Joe Burrow, than Mike Evans, Deontay Johnson, Claypool, Juju, Cooper Cub, DJ Moore. I mean, Corey Davis is wide receiver 26 on the season, and he's missed two games. So to me, he is an every week start. You got to, if you can't find room for him in one of your wide receiver spots, I think you flex him especially in a good matchup. I think he's a top 24 wide receiver this week. You got to keep rolling him out there. Tannehill is playing great as well. The defense is bad on Tennessee. We talked about it earlier on the show. They're in these shootout type games. I think Corey Davis is a must start. I'm with you, man. But let's get into our playoff version. Let's go. Big time. First week, everybody needs a win right now. It's win or go home in most leagues. I know summer double elimination Let's go through quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, guys that we expect to exceed expectations, whether that's a start of your week guy who's in a great matchup and is going to smash. You know, we smashed on Tannehill and Cousins last week. David Montgomery and Chris Carson were also really good calls at the running back position. I'll pass it to you first, though, at quarterback. Who's your start of the week in week 14? This one's a little risky, and it's someone who hasn't killed you this year but he hasn't really lived up to expectations. It's Matt Ryan, and he's going against the Los Angeles Chargers. I think this is a get-right game for Matt Ryan and this Falcons offense. The reason that Young Way Koo is the number one kicker in fantasy football right now is because the Falcons have been absolutely terrible at converting um, red zone drives into touchdowns, and they're settling for a lot of field goals. I think we start to see that regress to the mean here against the Chargers. The Chargers are 27th against the quarterback position. 20.5 fantasy points per game allowed to the quarterback. Now, Matt Ryan's only surpassed 20 fantasy points three times this season, but I have confidence in him to do it this week in the good matchup with Julio Jones healthy, with Calvin Ridley healthy, in a game that I think is going to be pretty high scoring, a 49-point over-under. I'll take the over on that one. So if you've yeah. been rolling with Matt Ryan, I think you can roll him out there with confidence this week. I'm starting him against you in our playoff showdown. It's going to be a quarterback battle. You've got Herbert. I've got Matt Ryan. Same game. Let's Falcons, go. Chargers. Definitely would rather have the Justin Herbert side. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I think Matt Ryan could have a fine game here as well. I'm excited to watch. This is going to be one of the games that surprisingly I'm going to have fun. circled, right? Atlanta versus L.A. But my quarterback start of the week is a guy from the similar, uh, cut from a similar cloth as Matt Ryan, and it's Matt Stafford, 
who has a matchup against Green Bay here in week 14. The Mats. Matt Ryan, Matt Stafford, these old-ass guys that are just somehow producing 4,000 yards a season. And when you look at the Matt Stafford matchup against Green Bay, that's the highest over-under on the week. He's coming off a 400-yard, three-touchdown game and a tough matchup against Chicago. He And, and if nothing else, where Matt Stafford is going to help you this week is with the volume. He's top 10 in attempts. Top 10 in passing yards, air yards, red zone attempts. And in the right matchup, he's always been a guy that you can start, whether it's garbage time, an early lead that the Lions end up blowing by the end of the game. Regardless of how the points come, (laughs) Stafford's going to be a guy who's going to be able to move the ball and put up points no matter who he's throwing to. I know Kenny Galladay has been a guy that we keep expecting to come back. I don't think he's going to this year. But kudos to Stafford for what he's doing this season. With the weapons that he's been given, his wide receiver one is Marvin Jones, and he's still producing. I expect to see more of the same here in week 14. I love it. I think Stafford is back on track now that Patricia is gone. We certainly saw him open it up in a tough matchup last week against Chicago, so I'm excited to see what he can do against Green Bay. But, Steph, let's go ahead and move on to the running back spot. My running back start of the week is Jonathan Taylor against the Vegas Raiders. And JT... It, JT is finally showing some life. Roll him out again this week after he had a great week in week 13. 13 carries for 91 yards, three receptions for 44 yards, and a touchdown last week in a good matchup against Houston. The matchup against Vegas is good as well. They're 28th against the running back position, allowing 28 points per game to opposing running backs. Now, some of that will go to Hines. Wilkins might get a couple carries as well, but we haven't seen Wilkins have a significant role in this offense for several weeks now. So I think Taylor's in line for another 100 yards and a touchdown. And a fun fact on JT, we didn't know what his receiving chops were going to look like. He's caught 29 of his 30 targets this season. Has to lead the lead yes. in catch rate unless someone's caught all of their targets, which I think is is very unlikely unless they've had <laughs> like one target for one reception. So roll out JT against Vegas. I think it's going to be a fun game as a Colts fan. Obviously, a lot of implications on the playoff race. But if you've held on to him this long, I think you can finally start to play him with some confidence. That efficiency in the passing game for Jonathan Taylor is something that nobody expected. But part of the issues with him on the ground from at least a lot of the film grinders out there that I follow on Twitter, on on YouTube, have said that, look, Jonathan Taylor just doesn't have elite vision. He can't find the open holes. Well, good thing is when you get a screen pass, doesn't really matter what your vision looks like. You're just trying to get upfield, get to the outside as fast as you can. And Jonathan Taylor's producing. He's been extremely explosive in the passing game. But my running back start of the week is Miles Gaskin against the Kansas City Chiefs. And this guy coming off a knee injury, there were some questions about, you know, coming off IR, is he going to get the full usage, the full workload? Miles Gaskin, everybody, is a bonafide workhorse running back in the NFL. He's not the most efficient guy in the world, but he's a trustworthy RB2 with some upside, especially this week in a competitive matchup. Gaskin is used heavily on the ground and through the air. He even lines up in the slot at times. He's averaging 15 carries a week. Last week versus Cincinnati, again, first game back from a knee injury, had 13 fantasy points, 72% of snaps. I expect that to go up. 21 rushing attempts for 91 yards, two catches for 51 yards on the ground. He's averaging 4.5 red zone touches a game, and he's actually ninth on the year. Miles Gaskin, a guy who didn't even have a starting job coming into the year, he's still ninth on the season in red zone touches amongst running backs. This is a guy who keeps the offense moving, is relied upon in valuable fantasy situations, and Kansas City is 20th against the run. We know what the Chiefs are going to do. They're going to go up big. Gaskin's going to need then to be relied upon heavily in the passing game. And right now in mostly winning game scripts, he's averaging five targets a game. So he's a reliable RB2 with upside this week. Start him with confidence in the fantasy playoffs. If you picked him up off waivers or had him stashed over his IR tenure, Congratulations. I think you have a winner on your hands in the first week of the playoffs. I love it. And welcome to 2020 playoffs where Miles Sanders isn't even the best Miles in fantasy football at the running back (laughs) position because Miles Gaskin has arrived. But Steph, let's move over to wide receiver. I'm going Marvin Jones against the Packers. I'm stacking him with your Stafford start of the week at the quarterback spot because MJJ is on fire lately. And I don't expect that to stop this week. 
You mentioned the the high over under when you talked about Stafford against the Packers. You mentioned the game script we expect with the Lions chef to throw the ball a ton. I expect a lot of points in this game and a lot of targets for Marvin Jones Jr. Marvin Jones is averaging 10 targets a game over his last four. Wow. It does look like Kenny G is still unlikely to play in this game. Honestly, even if Kenny G does play in this game, I'm still willing to roll out Marvin Jones because Jair Alexander should shadow. You know, if Kenny G's out, it's going to be Marvin Jones. If Kenny G's in, he's probably going to shadow Kenny G. So either way, I think Marvin Jones can have a really effective game here. Um, and since week seven, Marvin Jones is the wide receiver nine, averaging more points wow. per game over that span than Julio Jones, than DeAndre Hopkins, than Allen Robinson. So this dude's been on an absolute tear. So you can start him with confidence as a top 24 play this week. I love it, man. I love it. Marvin Jones, like a lot of people thought he was done. We loved him preseason, man, and he finally panned out. It looked rough at first, but if you stuck it out or picked him up off waivers after the brutal start, it's really paying dividends right about now. Well, my wide receiver start of the week is Brandon Ayuk. And a lot of people wouldn't expect, you know, Ayuk, he's not really the sexy name, but Despite, you know, the the fun upside plays like Chase Claypool, C.D. Lamb, Justin Jefferson, Brandon Ayuk has quietly been consistently producing in his first year in the NFL. I know the Washington defense is solid, but Ayuk has shown that he is an every week starter with Debo Samuel, uh, who he actually popped up on the injury report. We'll see if he ends up playing. But regardless, I'm still loving Brandon Ayuk this week. With Debo, though, his role has really been relegated to playing in the backfield, uh, playing in the slot, you know, jet sweeps, screens. Ayuk is playing as the go up and get it outside Alpha X wide receiver, and he's playing 90% or more snaps every single week. He's seen 9, 10, and 14 targets over his last three games. He's getting looked to in the red zone. He's had three touchdown over, touchdowns over the last three weeks, and he's been efficient yardage-wise. He's averaging 15.1 fantasy points per game, but hasn't been efficient in terms of his catch percentage with the bad quarterback play from Nick Mullins, even Jimmy G. Only has a 61% catch rate. His catchable target rate is 68%. That's 94th amongst all wide receivers, and yet he's still able to produce so you look at the run game struggles that the 49ers have had with Mostert still trying to get his sea legs. I expect them to struggle against a really deadly front seven again in Washington. We saw what they did against the Steelers. I don't think it's going to be pretty coming from Mullins, but I'm locking in Ayuk to see at least his average of seven targets per game. If he comes down with just four of those receptions, you're going to be happy with him as a flex or a desperation wide receiver too in week 14. I love it. That's a hot take, but... I like the vote of confidence for Ayuk. So let's move on to the tight end spot where it is brutal. And I'm going with Noah Fant against the Carolina Panthers at the tight end position. There's one thing to chase to me, and it's targets. And Noah Fant saw seven last week with Drew Locke back in the lineup. And if you look at the full season for Noah Fant, if we throw out the whole Kendall Hinton experience, like I think that game should just be totally removed. Yeah. Fant is averaging six and a half targets a game this year, and that would be fourth at the tight end position behind only Travis Kelsey, Darren Waller, and Evan Ingram. So Noah Fant's hyper-involved with targets, a super athletic tight end that can take any play to the house. And to add on to that, Carolina is 26th in the league against the tight end position. So not a bad matchup either here. You know, it's tough out there. I think Noah Fant has as good a chance of any to, to give you a solid you know, top eight performance at the tight end spot. If he gets into the end zone, you could end up being really, really satisfied as well. So Noah Fant against Carolina, you can never be too confident at the tight end spot unless you've got, you know, Travis Kelsey, Darren Waller, Mark Andrews, George Kittle. Um, But in this matchup, I think he's got a good, a chance as any to give you a good week. So we talk about how brutal the tight end spot is. My tight end start of the week doesn't feel good. He is a super desperation deep shot. You know, for guys in situations like me where I've been streaming, Anthony Ferkser picking him up on Sunday morning when Johnny Smith gets announced inactive last minute and plugging him in in my tight end spot. I've plugged in Jordan Reed off the waiver wire last week. Akins is the trip that we're taking if you're in this tight end upside stream uh, position like I am. Wow. And he's a matchup against Chicago which on paper, you know, they have a pretty good secondary, but they're bottom three against the tight end position. Deshaun Watson, we know he's going to find a way, regardless of who his weapons are, he's going to move the ball. There's no 
Will Fuller. They released Kenny Stills. This team was using two guys off the practice squad last week against the Colts. So you add in a better matchup. And I think Aikens has a stronger likelihood than most to at least score a touchdown and see some target volume. He hasn't been particularly great this season, but he's at least top 10 in average target distance, which gives him a little bit more upside in this matchup. So, you know, again, if you're if you're really desperate at tight end, you know, unless there's a guy that just gets in, announced inactive 90 minutes before kickoff on Sunday and you can pick up his backup, if we're rolling with what we know right now, I'm willing to plug in Jordan Aikens in week 14 as an upside play. I know it's disgusting, wow. But what else can you say at the tight end position? But Alex, I think that wraps up our week 14 preview, our week 13 recap. Let's get some dubs. Let's go. Good luck to everyone in your fantasy playoff run. Again, remember this. No matter what your points for is on the year, no matter what your record, if you are in the playoffs, you have an opportunity to win a championship. If you make the right starts at decisions, if you play the waiver wire correctly, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the strategies as things tighten and we get closer to championship week and week 16 but thank you all so much for listening and watching if you like what we do here on the show please hit that like button and that subscribe button that is huge for us and we'll catch you all next week peace Peace.